What's up, guys? Welcome to the Disc Golf Nerd Plastic Podcast. This episode, I am joined by two guests. We have Andy, who is my friend that you've seen on a lot of my recent reviews, um, out there throwing the discs for us on the reviews, and also James, James Hafer. He is hitting the road for his first time as a touring professional disc golfer. He actually has not even played an open event yet, but he is hitting the road. He'll be playing all the Disc Golf Pro Tour events and a bunch of other events across the country all year long we'll be keeping in touch with him so we kind of want to talk to him about some of his um, thought processes going into it some of his expectations his motivation for uh giving this a shot and all that kind of stuff also stay tuned because i will be posting james's in the bag video right around the same time this podcast will go live so if you're interested to see what he'll be throwing out there on the course um you can check that out as well so it's going to jump right into the conversation that we started talking about the uh, recent announcement or lack of announcement kind of a hype video um, from Discmania featuring Simon and Eagle. We kind of speculate as to what that video might have been pertaining to, and then we get into an interview with James, and we ramble about all kinds of different disc golf related topics. Let me know what you think of the uh, somewhat new format. Could be something we do uh, much more often going forward. I'll talk to you guys later. Cheers. None of you guys tell me what to do on my own show. We're going to talk about this weird thing with Discmania, and then we're going to go into an interview with James. Unless we don't want to. I don't care. That's what I'm talking about. Microphone. I don't know. If I'm going to ask questions because I saw something, but I don't know exactly Did you what see it is. any of it? I saw, okay. So I Eagle, saw Eagle post like the definition of evolution. Right. That's what I'm looking at right here. Okay. So, but I didn't see any follow up. What, what is this? The like a commencement speech? <laughs> the definition of evolution is yeah, this mania is sending me a box that I can't reveal anything about and building hype for something that will most assuredly let me down. All right. I don't know what it means, but they posted a video, I think Discmania posted a video, where it was like an unboxing with Simon and Eagle, and it was all jump cut together, so that they, like, kind of alluding to something being in the box that's groundbreaking and new, or something in some way. Okay. And they're saying the year of the evolution, I think I have an idea of what it might be, but I don't, I don't really know. My thought process is perhaps, aligning with their move to Colorado, that they're molding their own plastic now. That's my guess. That's the rumor that is f- flying around the internet. And it's probably true, and the hype behind it, because if UC is nothing else but a hype man, yeah. it would make complete sense that he would hype something that nobody would really care about. What difference would it actually make, anyway? I mean, if they're purchasing the molds and probably... The only way they know how to do it is that they're like getting help from Innova to learn how to run the machines as well, unless they're just figuring it all out on their own. It shouldn't really make that much of a difference. That's my official guess, though, is that they're bringing the manufacturing in-house, at least to some degree. Maybe the molds from here on out will be made in Colorado. I don't really know. That's my guess. What else could it be, though? I, I can't think of anything else it could be, and to answer your question of... Like, what would that actually change? Well, they wouldn't have stock issues at that point, most likely. Right. You know, where, say, P2s are mm-hmm. out of stock for a long time because mm-hmm. Innova's schedule supersedes any Discmania or, say, Millennium or whoever else they're molding. Right, which has schedule. been a legitimate problem with Discmania, especially in the United States for the last few years, is that, like, trying to find their discs can be super frustrating for their fans. So, so I don't know if that's... It, it, it just <clears throat> doesn't feel revolutionary or evolutionary or whatever it may be it it just if that's what it ends up being the hype that they're trying to build or did build would just be a total bummer letdown the only thing that i could think would be sort of a bigger deal would be somehow announcing a return of the disc golf world tour in 2020 but I don't think they would go with Simon and Eagle for something like that. It would be more of a UC yeah, thing than a Discmania thing. It could be, yeah, it could be some Pro Tour stamped disc of some kind, and that's the way they're trying to announce that. World Tour? But how is that, well, yeah, World Tour, but how is that evolution? <clears throat> Here's the other thing, so just hypothetically, if they were to bring manufacturing in-house, does that mean no more tag team Innova Discmania at all? I think that's likely, especially if you're looking at... I think that's the way it's all going. I I think within the next several years we'll see Latitude and Dynamic split, and I also think Dismania and Innova are due to split at some point. I don't really know, but it seems to kind of 
jive with that. I don't think they really want Eagle throwing anything by Innova. That's why they're kind of replacing those molds with this many versions of the Gator, of the Destroyer. You know what I mean? Oh, snap. Maybe that's why Paul left. He couldn't throw the FD3 anymore. (laughs) (laughs) This is a total deal breaker. (laughs) But also... Innova's best disc is Discmania. (laughs) Some of Innova's top guys definitely still throw a a substantial amount of Discmania. At least their putters, like Germ and uh, and Nate. Yeah, they're all using P2s. Mm -hmm. I mean, Eagle still has that Metal Flake Max, right? I don't know. I think so. He uh, up until last the end of last season he was still throwing the max he was still throwing the gator, but from what I understand the what the MD five is basically a gator, whatever I think. Their nomenclature yeah whatever their discs really are. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I thought that might be interesting to kind of speculate because they're supposed to announce it next week, so at least now I'll have some type of official guess on record. That's my official guess that they're bringing in some of the manufacturing in house in their new facility in Colorado. I can't think of anything else it would be which. With that being it, if that's it, wah, wah, like oh, yeah, kind yeah you gotta of, hype, you still gotta hype that up. That's evolutionary for them as a company. True, that is true. true. Maybe it's not definitely for, not, a maybe big, not for the game, a, but yeah, yeah maybe for them right. as a company. For Disc Mania, it would be a big deal, I would mm-hmm. imagine. I wonder, <clears throat> I wonder, because with the cooling process and everything that goes into making discs, if they do start making them in Colorado, it's gonna be a whole different biome right. than biome. Gonna cut this it's gonna out. be an entire different <laughs> biodome. <laughs> hey, bud. Last part. Uh, draining the lizard. Uh, <laughs> it, it's a whole different climate, right? Than southern or well, northern California, where Innova is, right? Mm-hmm. And I wonder how that will affect how the discs come out. Will everything come out more stable, less stable? Because I'm sure the. I mean, it's temperature it's controlled inside, but. Yeah. but do you think there would be some type oh. of effect being in altitude? Altitude, and, yeah. yeah. In terms of the way the plastic comes out of the mold and all that kind of stuff. Because even just, like, food cooks differently in altitude. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that, that jives scientifically. I wonder. It will be interesting to see how it goes down, I guess. But so, All right, let's get on to James. So, James, you're hitting the road. Well, let's, <laughs> let's talk about you first of all. Okay. Who are you? We got Andy with us. You guys know Andy. You've seen Who him throw you? on the I? reviews. Seen him on the Disc Golf Pro Tour. He's, he's been out there. <laughs> yes, you've seen me on the Disc Golf Minute or Disc Golf Pro Tour Minute Reviews. Brought to you by that Disc is Golf. True. Everyone assumed that you were me the yep. whole time. No, we're both fat and ugly, but uh, yeah. I mean, I'm fatter and taller, more hair. But other, if, other than that, <laughs> my ball spot definitely made a big feature on any broadcast that yeah. you've seen me on. Exactly. But yeah, so James, who are you? How long you been playing? What's your deal? And we'll talk about you hitting the road after that. Yeah, that's that's great. Who am I? Wow, uh, been in Portland for three years. Uh, pretty avid disc golfer at this point, but hey, yeah, I really thought you had been here longer than I had. Three been years, here about the same time. That's eh? it. Yeah, hey, that's world. it. Uh, yeah, just just hanging out in Portland, Portland, the Pacific Northwest, in my quest to play professionally in something. That's that's where this eventually is coming to. Is okay. played baseball in college. Thought I'd play professional baseball didn't pan out. Then I moved to golf, thought I'd play professional in golf, it's got to be easier to hit a ball that's stationary than is a 90 mile hour fastball, didn't plan out, mm. play out. Okay. Here we are. Disc golf is the perfect fusion. Golf strategy, baseball skill set. So picked it up after failed attempts at both baseball and golf and uh, gosh it's been probably six or seven years and then I had a three year hiatus in there when I was living in New York City since there are no courses in New York City. And, right. uh where yeah, is tell it? that what to George it? Costanza. I actually wrote, when I was in New York, I actually wrote, this is right after I learned what disc golf was and about it. When I moved to New York, I actually wrote to the Central Park Commission and petitioned and put a business plan together to put a disc golf course in Central Park. All right. I'm sure you heard back on that one. I have yet to hear back on that one, yeah. <laughs> Still waiting on a response. So we went with the other parks, like Flushing Meadows out by the Met Stadium. Also, haven't heard back yet. Yeah. So. Since I've left New York, they put in... I think at least one full 18-hole course in a state park on Long Island where I came from, and they have clubs there and all that stuff, but yeah. there wasn't anything before that. I think there might have been one course that was technically there, but it's like all Poison Ivy, like all Poison <laughs> Ivy. Um, it's like a beach course or something, and it's a, it's a total joke, so nobody ever really played it. Um, but yeah, they have some courses. Where are you from originally? Uh, a little bit of uh, little Chicago, a little Montana. 
Oh, okay. Spent most of my childhood and almost equally in both those places. So uh, that's how I ended up in Portland. You got to have nature at my disposal, but I also need the bigger city. Yeah. So and we definitely got that. Going got, on. Yeah, they got that combination here. Okay, cool. So you've been here for a while. You picked up golf after disc golf after you moved here. Uh, more seriously after I moved here, so I was definitely the casual player at the beginning, but fell in love with it and was trying to play as much as I could, and then went to New York and put the bag away, didn't really think anything about it, and then was really missing being outside, doing something competitive, anything active. You don't really get that in New York City, and so right. once I got back here, really picked it up again and hit the ground running, and that's what's happening. It doesn't hurt with the amazing courses that we have out here. Yeah. Yes. That is definitely We're not true. struggling for courses out here, that's for sure. I played my first real round ever, like the second or third day in town. We had just come to town, and my buddy had been here for a few years before me. He took me out to Dabney for my first round ever. Like, yeah, maybe the second or third day we lived here. You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm in the same boat. Uh, it was the second day that we got here. My wife had to work, and I was unemployed at the time because I quit my job to move out here. She could transfer, uh, and I was like, all right, well, I guess I'm just going to go take a drive up to Pier, and I played Pier, two rounds at Pier Park, uh, my second day living nice. in Oregon. Yeah. That's the way to do it. It's a good move. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a good move. Yeah, Dabney, maybe not the best first round ever <laughs> spot, like... I don't even know. Depends on what I, time of the year. I don't even know if I finished around because that was old school Dabney, so it was a ton of blackberries. Okay. It was super sloppy, like just wet everywhere because they've done a ton of work for drainage and stuff yep. since then. Um, and yeah, but once we got into the woods, I had no idea what to do. I had some kind of a driver, and it was just I was hooking everything out left so hard. I got really frustrated by the end of it, so I don't even think I finished the whole round. I'm not sure. I think I gave up for the last few holes. <laughs> so you mean Dabney was wetter than it is now? Yeah, Dabney was way worse than it is now. Oh, it used crazy, to, yeah. yeah, they used to be a ton of blackberries. Like the whole, when you throw up the hill and then you come down, there's that little wooden footbridge down through the to the gauntlet area down mm -hmm. there. Like that whole area was a, was a giant blackberry. Like everything right hand side. So if you turn anything right right over to the right, throw it up that hill. It was just straight up like huge blackberries. It was wow. crazy. Yeah, so they've done. Going to be at Blue Lake. Yeah. So they've <laughs> they've cut a ton of that stuff out, and they definitely carved in a bunch of drainage, and it's better, but it's still obviously a pretty sloppy. Some problem course. spots, but yeah, that's okay. Okay, so some things have happened in your life, and now here you are. You're deciding to try to hit the road. What kind of was this always something you've been thinking about trying to do, or have just a change of plans and life choices or whatever? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's a great that? question. Uh, yeah, I think I've always been one who wants to compete, so I think that's manifested itself in just the way that I approach my free time, whether it was playing competitively in baseball and then trying to do a solo sport in, in golf. I like that, that rush that you get from being competitive in some way, shape, or form. Right. So once I got here and saw the community that Portland has and the people that are here and the caliber of courses, it made sense to try start playing competitively and then... That's, that's how I've met a bunch of these guys, people I'm sitting here with right now, you know, right. great group of people. And so um, you start playing with slightly better people every single week or casual round. You're playing with people and you, you learn a few new things. You have people that know more about discs and brands and even sit there and critique you when you're throwing. And so I think it was a natural progression. You're and, welcome. Yeah. Thanks, thanks guys. <laughs> it's all because of you. We um, fixed everything. <laughs> Thank God. Uh, so yeah, t deciding to go pro was, uh, something I think, I didn't think I could actually do, uh, and especially last year after watching those guys come for the Beaver State Fling, yeah. and standing four feet from Ricky and Eagle, and seeing how much further and how much better they are than me, that at least lit a fire that it's possible if you're willing to put in the time. Right. And so, yes, I've had some changes in my personal life, and that has manifested itself into this opportunity that... I want to go and do this. I'm running sort of out of time as a 31 year old man. I'm running out of time to be competitive against some of those guys. Right. You know, Eagle being almost 10 years younger than me. Yeah. Uh, More and than 10 years younger than me? Is he, I think he's, is he 22 now? Or no, is he 21? He's over 21. Is he? I think he's finally 21. Probably. Or 22. He's 21 yeah. 22, yeah. But either way, like the, the he's studs, just, he the just studs looks are all so young, young with that vegan diet. I know. <laughs> he's just forever young. I can cook for him in the RV. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you certainly can. So you have not played an open tournament as of yet. I have not played an open tournament. And how many how many tournament rounds have you have you logged, would you say? Do you know? Uh ever since you're gonna you gonna look it up. I mean I can pull it I only, up. I actually yeah, only, yeah, I yeah. ended up rounds or rounds or tournaments? Um just events. So events last year I played six. I think the previous year I played my first year competitively I played fourteen. Okay. So probably around somewhere around twenty I'd say. And um, just a mix of divisions in there. You've done. Some I started events. the first year. I started in intermediate. Okay. I, I at that point I didn't know if I was intermediate, but I just needed to gauge. Mm-hmm. Um, pretty quickly was bumped into advanced, just uh, purely on rating. So I've been playing advanced for the majority of my of my time. Okay. And what is your rating currently? Rating as of the last ratings update nine sixty eight. What like what are some of your expectations? Are you, are you thinking more about a rating you're trying to hit, or a certain amount of events you want to cash in, or just like an experience that you want to have? Like what what are yeah. what are you hoping to get? The out? goals are are multi multifold. I think they they encompass everything. So at first it was, I just want to be able to be on the road and experience it. It was very ethereal, and I'll just have a good time and let's all be friends. As I've been thinking more about it. That that doesn't see that's not my style. I'd rather set a goal and then work towards it. So, get up every day and hit the practice basket for thirty minutes and, and hit two hundred putts. Then go play around. My goal is to in, play every day, play in all fifty states. But from just a purely disc golf perspective, I've added a few things to the list, which would be I would love. I don't know if there's a number, but I, I want to cash. I don't know what the number is. I would like to cash at some point because the interesting thing is. You know, some of these tournaments, national tourney events, they're only letting in 88 players. If I get in, which I'm hoping to get in a lot of these, or even the Disc Golf Pro Tour, you're literally playing against the best 200, 100 players in the world. Right. Even if I'm number 100, trying to beat some of those players, they either need to all have an off day, or I'm better than I think I am. And so my goal right now is to cash. I think I'll have to recalibrate how many or a dollar figure. That's not why I'm doing this. I'm not trying to get rich off how of Disc Golf. How many spots cash out on the average... Pro Tour event. Forty percent of the field is what they're trying to do this year. It's just looking at that today. Okay, and I know Steve has said in the past that he wants to try to kind of balance it out so it's not just like you win and you make a good amount of money and then from tenth down you're just looking at almost nothing. He kind of wants to balance yep. it out more so that everybody who's hitting cash is getting some type of legitimate sum that can kind of help you stay on the tour. Yep. So that'll be interesting to to track your progress. What what'll be some of the easier ways to for people to stay in touch with what you're doing? I think right now, uh, I mean, we might be doing some check ins here. So I think you're following following Disc Golf Nerd. We're gonna do some talks Absolutely. on the road and some updates. We'll definitely. Do uh, that. I think Instagram is gonna be the main following. It seems like all the pro tour and all the guys that are out there and the ladies have a pretty decent Instagram presence. And mm-hmm. so I think I'm gonna follow in their footsteps and. That makes sense. I try to grow my following. All right, give it to well. us right now. Where, what's your Instagram handle? Instagram is my name, James Hafer, at James Hafer. Okay. Nice and simple. simple. Yeah. You know, I found the other guy who has just at Disc Golf Nerd. It must be the same guy who owns uh, discgolfnerd.com. It's the same dude. And I was like, oh, okay. And I, I know this, I'm fairly certain this dude came around after me. It doesn't really matter. Like, it could just be parallel thinking. I'm not claiming that he's, like, took the name for me or anything. Um, but yeah, I found that Instagram handle. I was looking through it, and it's just bags, just like hmm. uh, this bag, that bag, just like people's bags, and that's all he's really into. And then discgolfnerd.com literally has like one bag, one or two bag reviews on it from like five years ago, and that's it. And I'm sure people think that's me, which is weird. <laughs> Another funny story, which James knows, but I haven't seen you. We play, so we're playing the scramble um, at Timber. We get carted up. We go over to hole seven, which was a much better starting hole than what we started the year before. Um, so we get to hole seven, we're hanging out, dudes come up, and, uh, really cool card. Uh, it was great vibes on the card, everybody's super chill. The dude is sitting there, he's got a, a hoodie, it says DGN, in green letters on his hoodie. And I didn't think, like, a, a ton of it, you know, it could be other things, but then, like, a few holes later, I was like, alright, I gotta ask this guy what's going on. So I was like, w- what's the DGN, what does that stand for? He's like, oh, Disc Golf Nerds. And I was like, oh, really? He's like, yeah. I was like, what is it, like a club or something? He's like, yeah, it's like my club with me and my buddies. And, uh, you yeah, know, we're the disc golf nerds and stuff. I was like, I, like, literally run a YouTube channel with that exact <laughs> name. And he's like, 
to he was actually I don't know if you caught this, but it was a little weird at first. Like he I paused for a minute. I, he yeah. like he was kind of like hesitant. Like I was gonna be like, "How dare you? <laughs> I'm contacting a lawyer right now." But I was like, "Oh, that's cool." You know, I was like, "Yeah, I run." He's like, "That's you." I was like, "Yeah, that's that's me." And I like pulled my cart around. I was like, "There's my DGNs like on my on my stickers on my cart." And then, like, later on, I noticed his buddy had a shirt that had, like, DGN on the sleeve or something like that. So that's them. So, like, I, grew up, I joined their Facebook group. It's totally hilarious. But, like, 208 players, random cards. And we ended up like that. Which was super, was super weird. I was it's like, this is trippy, man. Yeah. So it's a how, good name. It, it works. You know, great time for a transition. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I know you, and I know the answer to this, but... How are you funding doing this? Because, like you said, your goal is to cash. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not cashing, you're not making money. True. How, like, what are you doing to sort of, well, not sort of, actually make <laughs> this happen? Right. Yeah, no, it's a combination. There's, been, there's a lot of stuff that'll happen behind the scenes that no one will see. So if I disappear off tour, you'll know that everything I was doing behind the scenes failed miserably. But it's, it's using the simple stuff that I already have built up. So here, once I leave Portland, I'm renting out my house, either a combination of day-to-day -day renters or Airbnb, some type of VRBO, using the asset that I have available to make money that way. I also happen to have a skill set that I'm, I'm quitting my job, but I work in finance. I don't need to be in an office to do that type of work. Give me a computer, give me internet. Uh, I'm gonna be taking sort of that skill set on the road and, and either doing that for some, some for my company, but also a bunch of my friends that are entrepreneurs that need sort of that finance help. I can do people's taxes. So my skill set that I can do in the RV, in theory, should work along the way. Uh, people have joked that I should try to meet up with all the guys that win, like Paul's and Ricky's, and be like, hey, you guys need help with your finances? So. You know, That's honestly not, not that bad of an idea. Like, right. I'm sure a lot of those group balls don't know how to do taxes. Right. I mean, you have to assume Paul and Rick have financial advisors. They probably right? some type of advisor but, at this point. And, and probably but that's like the, that's the one percent, though. I mean, yeah. exactly. It's it's not like you're going to see. Well, I mean, poor example, but like Simon Lazat may not have a financial advisor. Probably using his. I mean, <laughs> like was, I said, poor example. I was thinking like like a. Someone that's cashing consistently, mm -hmm. but not like a, AJ Risley. Conrad. Mm -hmm. James Conrad. James Conrad. Yeah, there you go. James mm -hmm. Conrad Whereas, doesn't strike me as strong at taxes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't see him, you know, buckling down, putting the hair in a ponytail, yeah. slapping on some glasses, and doing his 1099s. Yeah, knowing exactly you know, where all that, you know, glow AVR money is going. That was also your chance to plug Flexline Financial, James. Ooh, damn. Good, oh. good transition. <laughs> well, I, hey, yeah, I actually did that. Shameless plug. I, I, I need to be. Plug. I, I, I forgot I to be that, paid for that. I forgot that I actually named my financial company around disc golf. Again, the, the vision wasn't to go out to the disc golfers. It may just be a, a lucky occurrence that that happens. But yeah, Flexline Financial is the name of my company. That's really not a bad angle because then you could definitely make some relationships with people out there and... Uh, yeah, kind of have something to fall back on that could keep you out there still having the experiences and getting better and stuff when you're still like Absolutely. not necessarily It's a unique. We, I mean, we, we were grabbing a bite to eat here earlier today and we were just talking about how is how is Innova making money? How is the Disc Golf Pro Tour making money? We're at this stage just in the game where we're on the cusp of this game growing exponentially. Right. And even looking at the Disc Golf Pro Tour's staff list, they have nobody on their staff that has like an accounting, a finance, a CFO. There's no financial person at that company. They have all the media, mm -hmm. they have a tour director, they have business operations, they have the UDISC web developers, they have a lot of the other stuff. Right. And so well, I would imagine, not necessarily in of other too large, but there's probably a lot of these companies where it, it's, it's sort of blue collar jobs. And yeah. we're probably getting to this cusp, even with the players, where there's an opportunity for that, that white collar type of job to sure. exist. It does seem like we've kind of, just in this one off season, it seems like we've already kind of turned a corner where it's becoming, very rapidly becoming more of a viable career choice and path for people. Like, mm -hmm. it's all of a sudden, it's starting to look like somebody who can actually play disc golf consistently well can make real money. Like, that mm -hmm. wasn't a thing for, for the longest well, time. Well, it's not even the players. I mean, up until what, two, three, may, maybe four years ago? The only people making money in disc golf were Innova, Discraft, 
and I guess you know for you know three years ago we're talking latitude and trilogy and yeah whatnot but nobody else was really making money unless you were making discs right now you've got you know Jomez with you know all three of them making enough to at, at the very least survive right mm-hmm. you've got Paul getting a mill over four years. Who knows what Rick's deal we is? We don't know what Ricky's deal is. But, like, I mean, we're talking significant real dollars. Right. And, you know, there's, like, I don't know what Huck Lab's financials are. I know they're not as prevalent as they used to be. Right. Um, shout out to are Jay. They, are they still going? Yeah, yeah. Huck Lab's, they, I mean, they've got, they've got a sale going on right now for Valentine's Day. Oh, okay. They brought back the St. John shirt. I actually bought one. I um, them. Didn't they have, they had a retail store up there. Yeah, it was uh, in like was right before, by Cathedral Park. Was that yeah. before your time? It was before my time, but yeah. it was. I actually looked, was like, oh, I can't wait to go to Huck Lab when I moved here, and then I was like, oh, oh yeah, no, oh, bummer. <laughs> but I mean, you've got companies uh, that are making money, and they're not manufacturing discs. Right, they're doing something other than that in the disc golf realm, and whale sex, grip belts. Well, yeah, well, I mean, grip belts is outside. I guess they've always been around, but, but yeah, it, you know, but definitely you, like black ink discs. There's more room there. in there. Yeah. They're just a, they, just, they just have discs hot stamped with stuff they designed, right. and they're making money. Yeah, it, you know, it, it. The disc golf pro tour is making money. Um, it's it's wild, man. There's it, a lot it of just, opportunity now for have, different, yeah, different, different. I've been different playing capacities. this game for like 15 years, like I have. Right. It, it's it's crazy to see where it's gone. From, you know, waiting six months, eight months for a DVD of Worlds. Right. Or a VHS, even. Exactly. Uh, and to now, like, if if I'm not seeing it next day, where the heck, what the heck's going on? <laughs> right. Or, like, complaining about commentators that I I'm, I don't like. Yeah. Like, we're, we're spoiled. Mm-hmm. And I don't think, sure. I, I think a lot of people don't realize, how, one, how spoiled we are. And two, what kind of money is actually floating around in, right. in this realm right now? Well, for like you and I that have been around it for 10 plus, it's kind of been incremental and slowly kind of creeped up, you know? Where if you were to somehow have experienced it when we started or when you started and then jump ahead to now, like it would be a lot more obvious the, the, the progression that's happened, but it's been kind of like a slow trickle here and there over a long period of time because like for for a while there these guys were negotiating contracts for plastic mm-hmm. you know what i mean it was like oh i need to get my 100 discs or whatever because they're going to flip them on the road and now we're talking about people getting paid salaries just to show up and throw the discs let alone performance bonuses and everything else um, i mean health insurance right like i they are employees of a company like Dave Feldberg didn't have health insurance through Innova when he was, no. you know, winning worlds in 2008. Certainly, certainly not. Certainly not. Yeah. I'm, I would bet dollars to donuts, Paul, Ricky, Simon, Eagle. I know, I know Simon and Eagle because they've talked about it on their, yeah. on their vlogs. Like, they're employees of these companies. Right. And, like, they're I'm fairly probably certain retirement that Paul mentioned savings. That somewhere so, like, after the mm-hmm. move, that, in, in some interview somewhere, he mentioned that that was part of the contract, I think. I mean, back back when, you know, 2005, 2004, oh, next year's the big year for disc golf. It's blowing up. It's getting huge. And right. you, you just hear that, that trope over and over and over. And, you know, if you take a step back and look at it, you're like, it, it really kind of has gotten... I mean, we're, we're, yeah. it's certainly not a mainstream sport. No. Let's let's not mm-hmm. get it twisted here. We're still a niche sport. Like bowling and and Ping cornhole pong. get better views right. than disc golf. But you know, when you've got a player signing a million dollar contract, when you've got you know, we've gone from two, three companies to now I couldn't name every disc yeah. manufacturer. Yeah. Whereas, you know, 10 years ago, I could have told you every single person that was making a disc. Yeah, I've personally tested 250 moles, probably, in my time playing. And, like, there's a ton that I haven't. Like, I can name 50 off the top of my head that I haven't tested either. You know, the amount of plastic alone is just bananas at this point. And trying to narrow all that down is another <laughs> is another whole thing. Mm-hmm. It's funny, because I was watching the, the building the bag thing with Felberg. 
and he's talking about all the plastic. And it kind of made me, I've thought about it a few times this off season, is that it's funny to have somebody all of a sudden be throwing something different and now they're being honest about the way they felt about the plastic before that. And it's like, this is just, it kind of... You know, it was, it was really know, funny to, to see, like, what was absent from that video? Every single one of his signature discs right. with Latitude. No Gladiator, huh. no Dagger, no Anchor, exactly. So, yeah. And then the same thing with Ricky, you know, after he's made the switch, he's done a bunch of things talking about how, how much better he likes the plastic and all that kind of stuff. And I get it, it's not like he's going to be on team blank and be like, yeah, this plastic sucks, I'd rather be throwing something else, but they gave me a better deal. Like, So I understand that, but at the same time, like Paul's been throwing it forever and it's the best plastic in the world. And now he's discrafting. He's like, oh, well, it just turns out that this plastic is so much better. All yeah. of a sudden, it's just like, all right, guys, can we just... I mean, everybody's making good stuff. Everybody's got terrible discs in their lineup. Everybody has great discs in their lineup. And it's just about what works and what you're going to throw. But it is interesting to see Dave and, like, what he will settle into being able to throw whatever he wants. Like, saying, I mean, he said, he, I've always wanted to throw a zone. Yeah. And now I can. Yeah, he's got a and, comment in there. He's got a few things. And I know that some of that definitely comes from the, the developing relationship between Next Gen and other manufacturers other than Lab 264, which we're going to see come out much more prevalent this season. Well, I mean, there's another mm-hmm. one right there. Next Gen. Next Gen, yeah. Like, yeah. Next Gen's... I bet you Next Gen makes more money than a lot of people think. Because, one, all the sponsorship that they, they got from Latitude and will get from many manufacturers, new, a different manufacturer, whatever, right. pumping in all the product, and, and, I mean, that's where that's where the money is in disc golf. It's in the AMs and, yeah. and people buying plastic. And, I'm you know, fairly certain entry. this year that a lot of the payouts will be in, essentially, like, online script to Infinite. Infinite. Yeah, that would, be, I mean, that would make which a lot makes, of sense. Which makes perfect sense, because then, what, no matter what you throw, because that's the whole thought process, is we, they want to bring in everybody who throws everything. So, no matter what you throw, you can find something you're going to want mm-hmm. off of a major retailer. Um, so, that totally jives, for especially for an amateur tour, where that's important still, you know? The, the pros don't care about plastic. It's a tool at that point. But guys like you and us and amateurs and stuff, that like that's part of the fun. I like collecting the plastic. I like trying new stuff. Like That's all kind of part of the fun for me. It's not just a tool. You know, that's that's part of... I like the collecting. I like all that kind of aspect of it. So it makes sense for Next Gen to do that and uh, kind of get away from being just kind of pigeonholed into one into one brand. So I mean, when do you actually... Let's, let's get back to your tour. So when are you setting yeah. out... I'm heading out February 18th. Okay. So it's so 10, coming 10 up days. Soon. Yeah, 10 days And now. you're going to be rocking an RV. Rocking an RV. Have most of that dialed in by now? Uh, I don't know, Andy. You like, what do you, what yeah, do you think? I got you to, got to I get got the tour. tour of the RV <laughs> earlier tonight. Disc golf cribs. Maybe yeah, we'll do a crib. Oh my gosh. We should, we should do, a cribs. do a cribs. It's not turned on at the moment. This so is I'm, where the magic doesn't happen. This is what happens. <laughs> because I'm a touring disc golfer. It's just me and my disc. This is where I do financial work on a laptop on my bed. Um, you can check out this sweet CRT TV I've got rocking up <laughs> on the driver's seat. The sweet tube nice. TV. Okay, uh, so you got the RV. You got the RV. The I need I need to need to clean it out and get it set up and right. get get it all filled up and ready to go. But for the most part, it, it's drivable and ready. It got plates today, so it is coming together. Okay. Uh, yeah. Plan is head out on Monday, the 18th, heading down to Vegas for. Uh, Las Vegas Challenge. Which uh, you'll be playing AM. Which is, yeah, mostly because my rating didn't jump up enough to hit that 970 and get in for that. So I'm, okay. this will be my last tourney as an AM. Um, Going to play that amateur and then right at that, head down to Memorial. And so I will declare pro in, okay. in between the two. Nice. Mm-hmm. That sounds interesting. Man. Are you going to actually fun. declare it like as you're driving from Vegas to... Probably, it'll probably be, it's got to be Just a blog like, post. Yeah, I'm like, a pro now. I'm a pro. I'll update my Instagram, put professional athlete on there. That's that's really why I'm doing this. Yeah. I just want to put it. It's all for the Instagram. It's just for the Instagram. Just for that little pin. you got to do it for the Instagram. Exactly. You're not doing it for the Instagram. Why are you doing it? Exactly. I, I mean, okay, cool. ask the white girls. They're all doing it. <laughs> So we just filmed you in the bag, so people can take a look at what you're going to be throwing out there on tour. Mm-hmm. So that's good. We you have your kind of uh, 
tour schedule settled up. You're going to be back in town for Beaver State and Portland Open. Correct. Is that the plan? That is correct. Beaver State's notoriously difficult to get into. It Have is. you registered for that yet? So that registration comes out basically the end of February, early March. Okay. And they, they tier that one as well. So 1,000 gets first dibs, 985 gets second, then 970. So and it never gets first, to 980. It never it gets probably, past It probably doesn't get to the Open. Doesn't. So yeah. Playing well in this first little month here is going to be critical to actually getting in, into the okay. BSA. Would you consider, if you haven't cashed yet, you'd still be an AM by Could that still be point. An AM. So would I, you consider putting in for the lottery for the the AM side I would, of BSA? I will play. Yeah, I will play as much as humanly possible. So right now, I'm still in for AM Worlds. Um, so if I don't cash until August or I don't cash at all. I technically could, I would make a pit stop and go play in Am Worlds again. Okay. See if I can improve on my finish last year. Uh, Where is that this year? It's in uh, York County, Pennsylvania. Pittsburgh oh. Flying Open. Oh, okay. Or formerly, well, not for this year, but. Um, so, like Deer Lakes and Moraine and those kind of spots? Ooh, Moraine. I think so. Damn, I'm so stupid that I didn't play those courses when I was there. I'm such an idiot. I'm, I'm going to be there. <laughs> well, there's no that. Probably next year, so I'm definitely going to try to do it then if I do. Yeah. Yeah. So what courses are you most excited to finally be able to check out? That is a good question. That is, that is a very good question. I Last year I really wanted to go to Emporia and play in Glassblown Open. I was trying to choose between, at that point, take an entire week. I knew I was already going to Worlds. I was trying to find, I didn't want to spend all of my vacation only going to disc golf tournaments, but I've always heard good things about Glassblown Open, and I've always wanted to go and play that and be there for the entire week and see how the community responds and, and just be a part of that. And I think Am Worlds was a pretty good preview, so I, I'm gonna love to see it sort of on steroids and have the pros there and have everybody there, because Am Worlds was great too. I mean, having that many players and being able to go into a restaurant, a bar, or, or just go to a course and run into a disc golf player that is so passionate about the game that they literally took a week off of their life to go and play disc golf. Uh, so I think that one it's pretty high on the list. Um, for some reason, Green Mountain, dude, uh, is so it's, sick. It's pretty high. On, on my list. Is Green Mountain just back to being a Pro Tour this year? Yeah. It okay. is Pro Tour again this year. And yeah. then I actually just signed up for um, the Canadian Championship on Prince Edward Island. Oh, I hate you. So... Because that... I, I watched the CCDG coverage yeah. of that. And yeah. That the course just, looks insane. So I think wow. that, that whole area is a place I wanted to go. That course looked amazing also watching the coverage. So I, that's another one I think that's those are probably the three that I'm looking forward That's to fair. Yeah. obviously Maple Hill is going to be up there mm -hmm. De La yeah yep uh, pro, uh, yeah, everything that's on the pro that's, that's I would play De La but it's not it's not even probably not even in my top 10 out of different courses that I know of in, in the country I'm not really that interested in playing De La it's just I don't know something about it doesn't look like I would dig it that much I think Elevation I, walking uphill no <laughs> I like I love Elevation I just it's just very brown and just dry. It's just not really necessarily my sensibility. I, I like more lush kind of green places, um, but yeah. I mean, obviously, I'd like to play it, but yeah. it's, not, it's not. It's not like my top. My top choices. It, it's it's one of those meccas like Maple Hill and, yeah. and you know pyramids and everything right there, and mm -hmm. you know, yeah. uh, I, I guess Emporia in general is. is sort of a mecca. Milo, which we have here, for sure. Mm -hmm. Mecca. Yeah. Um, Flyboy Aviation, if that still exists. Yeah, that definitely does. That's that's on my list for sure. I really like to see Sandy Point. I hear that course and the whole property is epic. Um, Sailor Ranch. Yeah, Blue Ribbon Pines looks BRP. amazing. Um, probably the top of my list would probably be, um, or close to it would be Jonesboro. I just want to see that property. It's, I, I know mm -hmm. it would kick my ass. I know I would shoot so terrible there. But it just looks like a sick property to play on. It just, I just looks really cool. I like the mm -hmm. sweeping elevation there, and a lot of long shots. And yeah, it's just all grass. And I, I think that that course looks pretty sweet. Pretty sweet. You know, Jonesboro is probably I, I, as far as ones that I haven't played. I've been lucky enough to, you know, I've played Brewster Ridge in Vermont. I did not play Fox Run because it wasn't a course yet. Uh, you know, I've played Winthrop Gold. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've I've played. Uh, Milo, obviously. Uh, you know, I've gotten to play some of the more hallowed courses. Um, I, I, Dela is probably top on mine just yeah. because mm -hmm. of the, you know, the that history that's sense. there. Yeah. Um, and then probably Maple Hill and Pyramids and everything. Mm -hmm. 
in Worcester. Yeah, Maple Hill is way up on my list for sure. That Maple Hill's no nope, Maple Hill probably my number one overall, but Jonesboro is definitely one that that stands out in my head that I would love to see. That would be really cool. I would like to do that for sure. So you're definitely going to check in with us and kind of let you know, let us know what's going on. Of course. And we'll follow along on your Instagram and see how things progress. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have any kind of a backup plan, like a bailout plan if you reach this? Tuck and roll? Yeah. Like RV off a cliff, <laughs> tuck and roll, fake your own dad? Yeah, I mean, I, again, I think the goal, really the goal with starting the company was to be on the road for the 8 to 10 months. Again, yeah. if money got so tight, the worst case scenario... I, honestly, I'd go and find a job that works remotely. So right. there's a bunch of startups. I was even looking at that initially as the way to get this, but I would love to be able to dedicate a year to disc golf. Right sure. now I'm playing, especially here in Portland where it gets dark at 5 p.m. in the wintertime, I'm playing a day, if not two a week. Right. So I feel like there's some untapped potential here if I could just dedicate seven days a week to disc golf rather than five days a week to an office job where you're sitting in the desk for 10 hours. Mm-hmm. So... The goal is to be there as, as long as humanly possible. There are other ways to make money, though, too. I mean, yeah, so I, I feel like this will be a full year thing. Yeah, there are. <laughs> yeah, there are. That's right. You I got have an the RV. RV. You I got, got the RV. <laughs> <laughs> Can't say that to that. So, um, it's got a fold out bag, man. So the plan is to go for the, You're not like dipping your toe in with the first third, and if it goes well, then you're going to keep going. Like the plan is to try. For I the was entire one of. Yeah, so the, the, the Pro Tour Pass, which you could purchase, you had the option of buying the first half second half or the entire thing okay i think there were roughly 20 to 25 people that purchased the whole thing uh-huh. and when we got the email like check your pdga number check all your information check how you'd want to get paid blah 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 it was an email chain and it lit or an email and it was to again these 20 25 people it was literally ricky page paul Macbeth, aj risley eagle literally like the top players in the game and at the very bottom of the list was me. <laughs> there you go. Uh, there it was, straight there on the list. On the I same wonder if, email I wonder if any, I wonder if any of them um, hey. like look through look through the CCs on the email. Like, <laughs> Who is James Hayford? I hope so. This dude is coming out hot. We need to we need to watch out for oh, this guy. I've never just heard of him. Yeah, and some of those like I think it was one one of the bigger names, James maybe, or maybe it was Michael Mike Johansson. Uh, so one of like the bigger guys like didn't even sign up for the full tour and so again right. they had them split out it was all the guys you'd want to see on an email chain so it was <laughs> literally laughable That's as hilarious. I got this email that and is awesome. in it which I'm not going to share but like they'd put everyone's phone numbers so like and some of us are like Rick. So like Ricky's phone number is in that email, right? And I'm like, oh well, I'm gonna take note of that. Thank you, and Ricky. You're gonna get blown up all the time. Add to contacts. Yeah, to contacts. Well, you'll be getting a few texts from me. So texts. Texts exactly. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Come to the army. Certainly no multimedia messages of any kind. <laughs> um, is there anywhere on the tour that you're not looking forward to playing? Like, is there any spot where you're like? I mean, I'll go play it. It's part of the deal, but it's not really like something you're looking forward to. Mm. That's a good question. I think what'll be interesting is because we're blessed here in the Northwest with great courses, we tend to have wooded. We have a Milo, which is long, but it's strategic. I mm. think we're honestly where I actually might struggle would be like those really long courses and golf course courses. Sure. So. You're going to find out real quick. I'm going to find out. So I don't know if like a San Francisco Open, maybe, which is... That course Glen looks Eagles. so good. It, it looks, looks, it looks awesome, amazing, but, it looks but really, so, really hard. But I don't, I don't have that arm, so I'm a little right. nervous on something like get me get me to a, a Jonesboro or something, or Idlewild or something. Give me back mm-hmm. into the woods. Yeah. And I feel like maybe that at least levels it out for me, but... Sure. Something like an is Emporia. Waco on the tour this year? Is that Waco's like a test on, event yeah, or no, something? Waco's on no, the tour. Waco's true. tour proper now? Yep. Okay. There was something that was like on the tour that's. Will you throw a better drive on eighteen than Saratoga? At Waco. At Waco. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I really hope so. We'll see. Um, I think I just, it'd be really hard for you not to. Yeah. I don't know. You've you've. I think you've seen some. I, I usually start most turns with it. Well, as long as long as you don't start on eighteen, I guess you're not shocked. <laughs> not, it's not shocking to start anymore. You get, you get to start on number one. This will be great. So James. So yes. You're packing up to leave. What are the essentials? That you are checking off your list as you're walking out the door, leaving your house, family, friends, everybody behind to go pursue your dream. 
I wish I had more packed in the RV and I could tell you the answer to that question. I'm making a generic list at this point, but again, I spent most of my childhood in Montana, so I tend to actually live a pretty minimalistic lifestyle. I prefer, originally when I was going to do this, before I found this RV, I was going to try to do it in tent, tent camping, because I love camping. So the goal is to take as little as possible and not make it all crowded in there, but I think from, a, from an RV perspective, I think it's any type of material that makes communicating with the outside world better. So whether that's uh, like a, a Wi-Fi extender or cellular boost or anything in that category, computer to communicate or blog or keep track of it. And you know, work. And work, yeah. I mean, I, I want to work as little as possible, but keep myself on tour. That That's the happy medium. I'm, I'm in this like, I'm gonna try working less. The golf is work if you cash. That's, that's true. It, it can become the job. So I think, Anything in that realm that just kind of connects you to the outside world will be good. Um, from just like a living, uh, you know, I, I eat a lot of smoothies, I eat a lot of fresh food, so whatever allows me to eat the way I do now as sort of a practicing vegetarian, you know, I, that's always the hardest actually is traveling, so I don't want to go to the Arby's and the McDonald's on the road, so I need to have the ability to fuel my body the way that I fuel it now, so making sure I can cook the way I do or eat the way I do anything that allows me to do that in the RV will be important so yeah. the Vitamix is a huge you have a fridge and all that on there fridge freezer it's it's a legit it's, fridge it's America. surprising yeah no, you, I know you it, I opened it up I was like holy heck man mm -hmm. <laughs> like yeah, I'll have, the fridge I'll is probably the bigger rig. than your freezer on your average like right. uh, uh, not side by side was it top and bottom right, okay. like, the fridge is bigger than the freezer right. and then the freezer is probably the size of your standard like over the range microwave so that should be able to work then mm -hmm. if you can just time it out where you're hitting grocery stores and stuff and plan it out and yeah. all that kind of and stuff and then disc golf that, that's honestly going to be the interesting piece of the whole puzzle you'll have the normal so you have your umbrellas you have your rainproof stuff I've right. got a couple extra pairs of shoes because I, I plan on burning through a few of those as I'm out there Yeah. but the hard part is going to be discs I think because I keep my bag the same I play Blue Lake I play Mile I play Devon I play all these courses around here A there's not a lot of water there's not a lot of stuff you're going out of bounds um, I know the course is like the back of my hand I know what my disc is going to do where right. all these courses are going to be new and different and harsh and I'm not sponsored by anybody so if I, right. I, have, I have four putters left they don't make those putters anymore if I'm throwing something over the water and one goes in the water, I'm probably going in to get it. So trying to figure out how that impacts my bag as we go, or just packing as much of my disc golf collection that I have, right? finding a spot for it somewhere on the RV in the, not probably if, for probably when I lose a disc or need to change something out. That's well, going to be the hard part to manage. It's good memori memorials early in the season. Yeah. Exactly. I'll know probably at that <laughs> point how many discs <laughs> I'm going to lose. Exactly. Yeah, that's true. And also, I mean, you'll be on the Disc Golf Pro Tour, so you'll have connections with people who might be able to help you, you know, hook you up with something. That's true. Need, Steal a few mystery know boxes somebody from who's, people. You know, maybe you know somebody who knows a guy who has a bunch of XDs or whatever the case yeah. may be. That should be helpful. Because um, I know it's in your bag from playing and also from, from your In the Bag video. You definitely carry... You're not like, I have five T-Birds, I have right. five Destroy... You're, you're definitely like, you carry a lot of molds that do one specific thing. Mm -hmm. Have you thought about how that might be, like, negative once you get out there on the road? If you lose something Absolutely. that fills a certain role, Absolutely. it might be kind of tricky. I have, I have more stories at home, but I, I don't really carry a lot of mysterious. You know, so right. some of those molds are, are kind of in my bag, and I use them for a shot, like you said, and then... They don't really come out of my bag that often. Right. So Yeah, it's not exactly like you have a, a stack of beat havoc laying around. Exactly. To throw off the team. Like, exactly. I've worked those to perfection over years. Right. So yeah, that that'll be interesting, um, how how that plays out. Well, I I, I imagine just this step up in playing level and also this kind of experience will probably evolve the way you approach building your bag in general you absolutely because I mean? now like, like you said you have a very set like i throw this disc on this hole at blue lake i throw this disc at this tee at milo you mm -hmm. know what i mean it's going to take you knowing exactly what every disc does and kind of tailoring each one of those discs to the shot that you're faced right. with at the time rather than knowing exactly which one to go into and this is something that i've been thinking about like 
for you, Andy, like if you're say you're playing a tournament, you know the course that you're playing that next day. Do you plan out every disc you're gonna throw on every tee and stick to that, or do you like nope. have a do you just feel it out? Well, because I was because when we were playing the scramble, I was kind of going through my head. I was putting my bag together. And A, I took a couple things out because I was like, why am I, I don't need a justice for like an escape shot, like a, some kind of patent pending forehand turnover or something, you know what I mean? Like, why am I carrying this? Like, it's four man teams, I don't need that. So I, I built my bag around that. But I was like, should I pick what I'm going to throw knowing that I know these shots and then go with that? And I thought that you had done that. You don't do that? No. I mean, I keep an incredibly simplified bag. Right. I think... If you don't count, like, SS and OS, um, versions of, like, Buzz and Surge and whatnot, as different molds, I carry five molds. Right. Um, in just varying stages of new wear and plastic and everything. Um, and I don't change my bag out, like, ever. Once, once discs are in there, unless I lose them, they're in there forever. And you don't, um, like, switch, because I will... Absolutely, put different things in depending on where I'm going. Yeah, all the no. time. You just carry this. I, I I can literally grab my bag and go to Milo. Grab my bag, go to Pier. Grab my bag, go to Rockwood. Right. It's gonna be. I throw the same disc. I don't. I don't take things in or out unless I'm legitimately switching an entire thing over. Like I had Undertakers, and now I have Vultures in there because right. I like the Vulture a bit better. It gave me a more wider range of stability. Within uh, that one, within mold. that one mold, right. And I'm one of those people that uh, you know I I cycle, right. And I keep you know I have I have five surges in my bag right now and five vultures, just across different stabilities where right. You know James has you know a destroyer, a sheriff, so on and so forth, covering that range of stabilities. Same type of disc, mm-hmm. but uh, you know I keep the more simplified. So. Yeah, I, I think in a I lot mean, of ways you carry more of a professional style. Yours is, that was, yeah, I agreed. You know what I mean? I, I kind of do as well because it's weird, but yeah, because you don't really put anything in and out, and you keep your molds really set. You don't you carry the same bag regardless of where you're going, but you yeah. have a lot of different molds to carry the different shots. Right. I don't use a ton of different molds, but I have a lot of individuals. Like I have like eight thrashers, and I don't know exactly which ones I'm going to carry depending on the day. I have like seven or eight gobies at this point you know and i like to i like i think part of it is i just like to switch it up because i like to carry and throw different things just for the fun of it well you didn't get 250 reviews by not throwing different plastic yeah, that is also you know true. it's not like you're re- all right guys this is the third review of this same <laughs> compass that i've reviewed four yeah, times exactly. and, and but and being know, the guy who's tested maybe more plastic than the large you know the big percentage of the disc golfers out there Trying to figure out what to carry on any given day is a hu- is a huge problem because <laughs> I've tested so much different stuff and it's all good like it all works for some kind of shot and some kind of player. It's not like mm-hmm. there's I could count on one hand how many discs I'm like this thing is just not worth throwing at all. You know they all have some type of role and so it's definitely d- difficult to to really dial it down. But you're like aggressive about it. Like you really make sure that nothing comes in or out. That's not like extremely deliberate, which is yeah. cool. I dig that. It's interesting that there's so many different ways to go about it, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, and you were talking like, so I'm going to play a tournament at, at Milo because it's easy. Um, no, Milo isn't easy. It was an easy course to pick. Milo is incredibly hard. <laughs> um, I keep that same bag, and you know, the night before, I'll run through a round in my head of what I'd like to do and where, like. This is where I want to land this shot to set me up for this shot. And the I, in an ideal world, this is how it would work. Right. But I'm not thinking what disc I'm going to throw there. Because at the at that point, I'm thinking when I get to that T, I'm thinking, okay, there's a headwind. I need to move from, you know, surge three to surge two because there's a bit more headwind than I would expect on a right. normal day. And so I'm not thinking of exactly what disc I'm going to throw. But I'm thinking of what kind of shot that right. I'm looking to throw, and then playing the disc from there. Okay. Do you operate similarly, James? Like, do you know basically what you're going to do, and then stick with that, too? Because that's the other thing is, like, even with times where I know I have 
I have a shot dialed in that I know that that's what I want to throw and I kind of have a basic idea of what I want to do, the disc and everything. Sometimes I switch it up for various different reasons, you know, and I wonder um, how much that affects the score ultimately If where if you were to just really stick to it, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I think I approach it the same way. I think that that's sort of the most preparation you can do in disc golf. So playing courses as many times as we do, you kind of get a feel for what it should look like. Um, and again, that, that's what's interesting, watching the pros they're doing that same thing, they just have a different expectation of what it should or shouldn't do. Right. And so I tend to approach that same way. I have an idea of the shot I'd like to make. What I find is interesting is usually once, I don't know, picking like a hard hole at Milo, if it worked, or yeah, at Milo, I'm trying to think of the, what is it on the east side, hole four on the east side, it's that the last one in the woods where it's really tight, all the pros throw forehand roller because it curves up into the left there, it's right before you get out of the woods. Yeah, yeah. I think the first time I ever played it, is it five east? Or whatever. Five East and BSF layout. I have no idea. One, two. It is five. Um, all the pros, they're forehand roller. I think the first time I ever played it, I grabbed a stable disc, and I piped it right through the, that little tiny gap, hit the ground, and it skipped and sat under the basket. I think I've thrown the same disc every single time. I don't think I've ever parked it ever again. Yeah. And so what's weird is sometimes I get so fixated because I saw it work once, yeah. but then that's, that's what I picture in my head every time is... I know it can work, but the pros throw a forehand roller because that probably is the higher percentage play. They're not hitting a tree and taking a bogey right. ever. Right. They're probably taking some pars, but they're probably birding it, you know, four times out of ten versus my one time out of a hundred or whatever it is. Yeah. Well, I think at the higher level, a lot of those pros, especially on a hole like that where it's a tight gap, it's kind of a bonus too. It's definitely, you can get it, but it's not like one you're super it's counting on. one they're on. banking on, I don't Yeah, think. like mm -hmm. the one before that, you you better be getting that one. But like, mm -hmm. <laughs> that particular hole that you're you're referencing, yeah, it's kind of, you just definitely want to get through there with a three. So, most golfers at that level are looking for the highest percentage shot that will get them the best results, the, you know, most of the time. Which is why, nine times out of ten, if they can, they're going to throw a hyzer. Mm -hmm. Because it's the easiest shot to throw, and you know exactly what it's going to do. Mm -hmm. You throw a stable disc, you leave it out to the right, you play the fade, and that's all there is to it. So, yeah, it's interesting. It'll be fun to see how your game kind of changes, how your bag might change. Like, maybe we'll do another in the bag catch-up, like, halfway through the season. Right season. after the memorial. Yeah. Right after the memorial. <laughs> right There's my bag. There are no discs in it. <laughs> yeah. I lost them all. I've got two putters left and one, and this one disc that I don't ever throw it. But it's This one right. I fished out while trying to get my other ones. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It, it's, like, I think this is Garrett Gerthy's Pharaoh. Um, but it's, it's mine now because I'm having anything else. Yeah. I didn't call him back to see if I could keep it. He's, I figured yeah. he's got enough, he's right? Got he's fine. Yeah, he's got <laughs> he would have told me to keep it, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. So, I know, because we had talked about it previously, uh, you have a ratings goal of mm -hmm. trying to get to a 1,000 yes. while being on tour. Yes. So, I have a proposition for you, Justin, disc golf nerd. What? You want to take a bet? On whether one he gets two thousand or we each pick a number and whoever's closest after what after the end of the season? after the end of the season oh that's something we could think about we could discuss that on the next episode perhaps I don't know enough about ratings to really feel confident in that because because he and I had talked about on the way home from the scramble is that it's going to change a lot just because of the fields that he's going to be competing against. Right? Because playing against a disc golf pro tour field compared to Stumptown slash number two or whatever, that alone has a big effect on the way the ratings come in, doesn't it? Well, yeah, because the propagators are all, right. you know, thousand yeah, plus. So, I, so I, I mean, you get a bump just alone playing in the field. And I think years ago when I calculated this, um, it was like 10 to 12 points. Back when I actually like sat and did the math and tried to figure out like, you know, okay, so you have a field of a you know eighty thousand rated players and a field of, or versus a field of four thousand rated players, you know, this many nine eighties, this many nine seventies, and it, it it always worked out to be about ten ten point ten to twelve points higher. So okay. my thinking is now it's probably closer to. 15 to 17 points as far just as, as an automatic bump. ratings for those events. yes right so okay. like you know you go play milo east with uh, on like a slosh tournament right. and you shoot even and it's rated x if you were to play milo east 
in BSF with all of the, the you know the top right. top names, best golfers in the world. It's going to be X plus fifteen points. Right, right. Because just because the propagators are are much higher rated and right. there's more so, exactly. so so based on that alone just him being on the road playing the field he's going to be competing against does give somewhat of a of a natural boost to try to help that out where if he's yeah. playing local tournaments it would be a, definitely a more difficult test to, to uh, that that makes it even crazier when you see like a guy like Matt Orham who's like what 10.30 or something. He's like, broke... He, uh, I think he broke 10.40. Yeah, and he's not not even really on the road, like hardly at all. Basically just playing yeah. regionally and yeah, just... Yeah, but playing Southern... Na- Does Southern National still a thing? I don't know. You, I never hear about it anymore. I know that. Like, they don't have any kind of, like... Because I remember that was, like, a thing. thing for a while. Right. Southern National... Leave a comment if you know if Southern Nationals <laughs> is still yeah. going. And, and that, that it's not just, like, the like, share, subscribe, leave a comment below, whatever right. garbage... I legitimately want to know if Southern yeah. Nationals is still. That'd be something. That'd be cool to uh, try to investigate that and see what's up. Yeah, that'd be is, interesting. Like, is NIFA still a thing? Because they had like individual player numbers. What is that? I don't know what that is. New England Flying Disc Association, New England Frisbee Association. Oh, something like I've never even heard of that. They they had numbers like membership numbers like the PDGA does. Really? Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Leave a comment if you know what that, if that's the thing. <laughs> Leave a comment if you've ever heard of that, ever. <laughs> I have not. Um, did you know um, gentleman that passed away the other day? The local Jim. guy, uh, Jeff Elliott, I Jeff. believe his name was. Did you know him? I've seen, him. seen I've him. I've seen him around, but mm-hmm. I didn't know him. But anyway, just, uh, yeah, condolences to his family and a lot of outpouring of support from the... From the local, his PGA number was like one six three or something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. He passed away suddenly of a heart attack. He was definitely a local Portland guy, and a really well known dude in the area. And, and everybody seemed to just have nothing but good things to say about him. So rest in peace to Jeff. And uh, yeah, my heart goes out to his family. I just heard about that the other day. That just happened. Did you hear about this? No, it this just, is the first time I just, a bunch of people today. like yeah, Nate Sexton had posted about it, and like mm-hmm. a bunch of other Oregon golfers on Instagram and Facebook and stuff. Clearly, I'm not connected enough. Yeah, I think period. I think he's like, yeah, he's very. Uh, um, pre- he was prevalent in like the stump town and all that kind of stuff. So I thought you might have you might have run into him. On that note, I think we'll let you guys go. We're looking at about an hour, or so we just wanted to check in with James and see kind of yeah what your motivations, what your goals. Um, one more fun one actually that I had that I wanted to ask you. Mm-hmm. So we get say pick an event, a random event, say memorial. You get there and they draw random cards. What's your like? What would be your dream card for them Ooh. of anybody in the field, which is likely to be basically all the top all, all the pros. Yeah, uh, I I got to put Rick on there first. Okay. Uh, yeah. What, 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 why? Why? I don't, I think I think I started watching disc golf when Rick was like an underdog. Right. Uh, which that seems now. I was gonna hard, say so hard now? to believe. <laughs> he, he, he definitely has something to prove going into this next season. Yeah, so it's probably it's probably year. like right when I got started again. So it was probably right before. It definitely was before his probably his first world championship. Which or was probably that, maybe 16. that season. He won sixteen. So maybe been sixteen because that, that was when I moved back here. So okay. it was probably when I was getting back in the game. So I had to put I had to put Rick on there. I think that's fair. Um, yeah, no way. No, really. <laughs> uh, God, dream card though. I, don't know, I, feel, I feel like Simon would be really fun to play with. Simon, for some, yeah. For some reason, I would just love to actually watch Dude, him I throw. Still, I it. still love at BSF last year when he tried to throw, it was on 16 East on the final round, top card. He threw a not-so-great tee shot and then tried to cut Oh, he tried to throw corner, a cut roller through, and like, no gap. And through then no like gap, nowhere, feet. and, like, <laughs> threw it, and then was like, oh, sorry. Yeah. Like he, he apologized for how bad of a shot yeah, it, was, it was right so there. It was, yeah. well, he is yeah. just hilarious, dude. He is really funny. Yeah, yeah. Simon's got to be up there. So Talk about someone sense. doing it for just the love of the game. Right, yeah, absolutely. Exactly. So we got one more. That's a tough one. Billy Crump. It's got to be Billy Crump. What's up with Billy Crump, by the way? Where is that guy? I legitimately tried to track that dude down. Um, I couldn't find anybody who knows anything about Billy or where he's at. Like, I posted on a few things on Facebook and on, on Smashbox and stuff, and I've been trying to tell Terry to get in touch with him. 
be like, what's going on? He's sitting on a ton of footage that could turn into an awesome, like, historical kind of YouTube channel of, like, all these old events that he covered for Clash, and he's sitting on all that content. Anyway, that's Those not Clash really series were awesome. You, you know, not to go off on a tangent, <laughs> but, like, that makes me think of Timmy Gill and Disc Golf TV. Yeah. You remember that? And, like... Oh, yeah. Like, Alti World used to do... A, they did, like, a very short series of, like, where are they now? And they had Marcus Schallstrom, uh, oh, really? Mike Randolph... Uh, like all these names that I remember from when I started playing and everything. Jesper Lundmark was just where, the where, guy in Europe yeah, for a while and like, he kind of disappeared. Uh, Christian Sandstrom, world yeah. distance holder for a like, terribly he, he long He came time. back around. He was throwing MVP for a little while. Oh, I, yeah, really? I saw him. Because I was thinking about that the other day because he was on some kind of like LCGM8 uh, coverage not not terribly long ago. Oh, so he's still yeah, around. Yeah, he kind of resurfaced or whatever. But yeah, Billy Crump, I've never, I haven't heard anything from him since the American... Disc golf tour. That was the last time he did anything. Which, I wonder if he's just like he opens a storage unit and it's just boxes of Flash DVDs, and he's like, "What do you do with it?" Well, this is what I'm saying. If he ha- if he just took all that content, and put it out there on the internet, I think it would get a lot of views from people that are interested in that sort of thing. I'd love to go back and watch Clash at Rennie, yeah, and and stuff like that. Yeah. Just like take take me back to 2006. Yeah, and that'd stuff be really and, cool. Okay, so dream card. We got Rick. We got Simon. We got Simon. Who was the last one? It's a toss up. For some reason, I'm, I'm gonna put. I'm actually gonna go Big Germ, and that's because that sounds. I like that call. I think Big Germ is a fun guy to have. I think on he's a fun card. guy. He and talks a lot. He keeps it light. He's exactly. Around. And at BSF last year when they were in town, at at the end, I was watching with a buddy Thomas, and. All the kids are going around. They're asking everyone for autographs, and everyone's asking for autographs. And you know, it's ten year olds, fourteen year olds, and then Thomas and I, rather than going to ask for autographs, we went and tried to talk to every pro and ask them to come play peer with us the next day. And so Germ was the only one. He gave me his fe- Facebook information. We messaged back and forth for a little bit. Super approachable, great guy. Like you said, everything you just said. Yeah. That held true to a random person that came up to him was like, "Hey, do you want to come play peer with me tomorrow?" And Unfortunately, he was going down the opposite direction with Nate to go play in the doubles at Whistler, but oh yeah, um, which they dominated. Which they dominated, but uh, oh my god, they yeah, crushed. good guy. I think it'd be fun to yeah. get out on a card with. That's a good call. That's pretty close to mine, honestly. I don't know. I, might I was gonna say what is yours, up. Rick, and then two clones of Rick, <laughs> so Rick and then whoever else, because I'm just gonna ignore that and yeah. watch Rick the whole time. No, I don't know. What what would yours be? Just out of curiosity. <clears throat> Simon, Germ, uh, and then we're, I'm kind of reaching at that point. Uh, but this might sound out of left field, but he plays open, technically, Jamie Thomas. You'd like to play Just because I'd like to, like, the conversations that would be had there, w- I think would be amazing. Okay. Like, it, you've got Simon and Germ, who you could just joke around with the entire time. Yeah, and then I could just pick Jamie's brain about all the stuff he hates and like get all of his hot takes <laughs> and everything, and just enjoy just everything about that. The card the entire day, just it would rambling be, it I think it'd be a pretty great card. I can't okay. believe I came up with that so fast either. That's pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, I think Jerem would probably be on mine. Rick is an absolute given. After that, I'm not really Sexton. sure. Sexton would be fun to have on a card, I bet. Sexton would definitely be fun to hang out with and play with, but I don't know if he's really my choice. Doss would be up there. Doss is a really nice dude. Yeah. Extremely cool guy. Also a 1050 rated spotter. Yeah. Um, he's spotting for, I think it was Slosh last year mm-hmm. at Milo, spotting for the Grandmasters. Oh, really? Right. <laughs> yeah, Nate's a cool guy. He's he's awesome. I'd probably go Yuli, though. That's probably... It'd be mm-hmm. Rick, Yuli, and... Good uh, call. And Germ. That would be a really fun card. All right, so outside of Germ, because uh, I feel like that would probably be all of our answers. Right. Who do you want to have a beer with? Oh. That's a tough one. Because mm. that kind of opens up a whole other door to it. <laughs> More of, like, who you want to, like... You know what? Let's save it for a different... Thing. Let's save it for a whole <laughs> different episode. Next, <laughs> okay. next episode. Okay, we'll leave that on a cliffhanger. Okay, so we just want to let you guys know what James is up to, and uh, definitely keep track of him at James Hafer, um, just H A F E R, correct? 
correct? James Hafer on Instagram. We'll be doing some uh, regular check-ins with you as the tour kind of progresses. I'm sure we will meet up with you again when you're back in town for Portland Open and Beaver State Fling. We've already talked about um, doing some caddying, maybe. Absolutely. Maybe Andy and I will split duty on that Mm -hmm. um, while you're in town. That will definitely be fun. We'll have everybody kind of keep track, and we'll definitely let everybody know if you start a YouTube channel or anything like that. We'll, uh, We'll be sure to keep everybody posted. So thanks for listening, guys. We'll check you later. Peace.